My, my sermon today, I titled it, uh, Words of Life from a Dying King, uh, Instructions for Keeping God's Favor. And um, this is a, a message that, um, I think it's one of these, uh, it's, it's one of the, the messages where you see the right words on, in Scripture, but unfortunately sometimes, um, sometimes, you know, you don't see the correct result happening on the other side. And uh, I think it's just one of these messages where maybe it could be, you could see it almost like, a cautionary uh, example of, um, you know, the right things could be said into our lives or, you know, we could be told the correct examples, the, the correct way to live, and yet, even knowing those things, um, sometimes the, the result just isn't there. Uh, so uh, I wanted to share just, um, you know, the thoughts that, that God put on my heart with you today. And, um, you know, and it really comes out of this question of how do I want to bless my children? Um, you know, all, doing what I do in my career as a teacher, um, you know, now being a father, um, being a youth leader, um, now, you know, then a deacon and, and a pastor, uh, just understanding that uh, people are watching you. Uh, people are, are looking at how you live your life, uh, how, you live, how you live, what you do, what you don't do, you know, and there are moments in, in your time where you're able to kind of speak you know, give people, uh, you know, life uh, through what you do and what you, what you don't do even. I, I still remember having a conversation with a student and, you know, told him um, after he, he said, hey, have you seen a particular show? And I, I said, well, no, I, don't, I didn't see that show because, you know, I looked at the content in it and unfortunately it's just not something that I, I, I allow myself to watch. And, you know, he was maybe like a 10th grade student or something. And I said, and he, I remember he like, looked at me, you know, to, to his surprise, because you know, I'm, I'm a grown man. Technically, legally, I could essentially watch whatever I want to. And to him, it was very surprising um, that I, I'm willingly choosing not to watch certain things because of the content in there. Um, and maybe that was the first time he had ever, just based on his reaction, maybe that was the first time he had ever interacted that kind of a, uh, that kind of a response. But, uh, you know, especially now having, having boys in my life and realizing that they too are watching how I live my life, and uh, what 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 do I want to pass on to my boys and, and my children, and what do I want to pass on to to the youth in this church, even or um, to to the students that I interact with? You know, what's what if I had an opportunity? What would be the last information I could share? And again, this is not I'm not planning to die. I'm not planning. Um, you know, this is not hopefully not my last sermon, but uh, this is you know just something. You know, I think it's always a healthy reminder about what kind of a legacy or what kind of, what, what is the example that I'm leaving behind? And, and if I have the opportunity, what could I pass on to my boys? And I think a lot of times, you know, when we think about what, what I would like to do, sometimes it's like, hey, don't make these same mistakes. You know, choose the right career. Uh, make sure you live in the, in the right part of town. Uh, make sure you marry correctly. Um, you know, all, the, all those things that I think are important and they're important conversations and, and, and lifestyle choices. Um, and I, I, you know, just thinking about that, you know, there's a there's a certain blessing that comes with when a father or parents in general um, pass on a blessing to their children, and uh, we see this, you know, we see this happen in, in scripture numerous times. If you remember Isaac blessing, um, you know, Jacob and um, uh, Jacob and Esau, we have Jacob then passing on blessings to his uh, to his sons. Um, we even have in the New Testament. Now, the story of the prodigal son, if you remember, how he demands a blessing from, from his father, a financial blessing, but a blessing nonetheless, um, so that he could leave and live, live how he wants to. There's a certain power that comes with, uh, you know, what it is that a father can kind of bless or, or pass on to, um, to his children. And, you know, one of the, maybe the best known examples of a, of a blessing is, is uh, from Numbers chapter 6, when uh, God tells Moses, hey, pass on this blessing to Aaron and his sons. And it's, it, we sing a song. Um, we, we say this numerous times. We said it just you know, a couple weeks ago here in church. Uh, this is Numbers chapter 6, starting in verse 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, Numbers chapter 6, verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, thus, uh, thus you shall bless the people of Israel, and you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. 
What an amazing, you know, amazing set of words that, that you know, God told Moses to pass on to Aaron as, a, as the priest, just to bless all, of, his, all, the, all of, of God's children, right? And all of the descendants um, you know, th- that were going to come. And I, the main passage I wanted to take a look at is, is King David. And, and David, you know, maybe the best known king um, in, in Israel, also came, there came a point in time when it was time for him to also give up his throne. And um, after having served a very successful, uh, a very successful, uh, you know, uh, kind of period of time, it came time for him to pass it on to somebody else. And I want to, you know, I want to pa- turn to uh, First Chronicles um, chapter twenty-eight is going to be the, the main kind of passage I want to uh, focus on. But when when this chapter starts, David is old. Um, we know that uh, you know in, in other uh, in, in in Second Samuel we read that David took the king to, to became a king when he was about the age of thirty. He reigned for forty years. So uh, you know we can assume that David died at around the age of seventy. And um, I, I you know, I'm kind of guessing here, but David here is probably around you know probably within a year or so of his death at this point. So he could have been late sixties, probably even age seventy. Um, when he, he realizes his time is coming to an end. And he realizes that he has to pass on uh, this kingdom and the, the authority that comes with being a king um, to his next son. And David had a lot of sons, and he says that. Um, but there was a special son that he needed to, to, um, to pass this on. And, and David, in, in uh, First Kings, we read that David, especially towards the end of his life, was so sick, um, he couldn't get warm. He was probably very skinny, probably very frail, uh, started having health issues. Um, and he even, uh, they, they, they took a servant girl just to, just to help him out, just for the, for the remaining part of his life. Um, she was just supposed to serve him until he, until he died out. And so David was very frail and very weak. Uh, and we see that, you know, in the start of this chapter, in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, David brings everyone, everyone who is someone in Israel. He brings them out. Um, and it's interesting that um, if, uh, in verse 2, in chapter tw- 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 2, it, it's, you know, very rarely does, you know, um, the, a specific action is, you know, shown here. But notice how it starts off. It says, and then, and then King David stood up on his feet. And I think that's important because uh, David was, was so sick he couldn't even stay warm. I mean, he literally was, you know, a little girl was, or a young girl was hired specifically to, to, to care for him as he's dying. And yet for this occasion, a king who could barely, you know, was barely alive at this point, mustered up enough strength to stand up because he knew he had a very important job to do. And he, he begins by, first of all, kind of summarizing to, the, to all the people about who he was and what he had accomplished. And if you look at verse uh, 3 with me, uh, sorry, verse 2, the remaining part of verse 2, it says, He rose to his feet and he says, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations, but, the, but God said to me, You may not build this house in my name, for you are a man of war. Right, so David had this deep desire to to build this home, and yet God said, "No, you can't do it." Right? He, he, God didn't let him, and instead um, he goes on in verse uh, verse five. Um, it, it says, "And of all of my sons, for the Lord has given me many sons, He has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the kingdom of God over Israel." Right, um, and. And he re- and you know David realizes David knows exactly who this next who this next son is, and so he's this 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 uh, situation or this scenario is to give his kingship his authority over to his next son. And, and as I'm reading through this passage, my, my thought is, okay, David, what are you going to tell this king? You have 40 years of experience. You have 30 years of being chased by the previous king. Um, you did am- amazing, mighty things. I mean, you look at the, the story of King David. I mean, there's just, you know, excitement at every turn. Adventure, right? I mean, success uh, almost in anything that he did. David, what are you going to tell your, your son Solomon? I'm sure there's so many, you know, do's and don'ts, that, a whole list of them that David probably could have left for, for, for Solomon. Um, and so, uh, and God tells him, like, you're going you're gonna to pass this on. Right, and it's interesting that God God tells um, God tells David to tell Solomon. Right, verse six, 
And God said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who will build my house in the courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish his kingdom forever if he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules that he is, um, as he is today. God said, I will, I'm giving Solomon the king, the kingship. And he's going to build my, my house. And I'm going to bless him. And notice for how long. It says that I'm going to establish his kingdom forever if he continues. It's kind of like a conditional uh, requirement there. He's like, I'm going to bless him, but he has to do certain things. And it's not that God is harsh, um, but he's simply requiring a certain level of obedience and a level of acknowledgement that, Solomon, you're going to be a great king, but there's somebody even greater, and that's me. And you have to... You have to make sure that you're following after me. And as a father, David, David understands there's a big responsibility or a big, a big uh, task that he has at hand. How can I hand all of this huge responsibility over to my young son who hasn't reigned a day in his life, but is immediately going to be kind of these, these responsibilities going to place on his shoulder? And after David finishes addressing you know, the crowd, verse 9 David, in verse 9, he turns to his son, and this is what he says. And you, Solomon, know the God of of your father, and serve him with your whole heart, and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts, and understands every plan and thought. And if you seek him, he will be found by you. And if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And I want to kind of zero in on what is it? that David specifically tells his son. And there's three things that I wanted to, uh, wanted to draw your attention to. The first one, he says, and you, Solomon, know the God of your father. Number two, he says, um, you need to serve him with a whole heart. And number three, with a willing mind. So I wanted to kind of you know, spend some time kind of breaking those things down, uh, taking a look at it out of everything that David could have shared. He says, I need you, number one, Solomon, you got to know God. Number two, you got to have a, 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 a willing heart or a whole heart, a loyal heart. And then number three, you need to have a willing mind. Those three things, Solomon, if you can do that, you're going to be successful. He didn't tell him about, you got you to do A, B, C, and D. You, gotta, you can't do you know, you know, X, Y, and Z. He said, I need you to do those three things. If you do those three things, you're going you're gonna to be all right. Now, uh, we're going to start off with the first one. He says, I need you to... You need to know the God of your father. That word "know" um, is the Jewish is the Hebrew word um, "yada," and it's a very it's a very intimate knowledge. It's not something like I know I know all of you, right? Because I've seen you once, and I know your name, or you know maybe we we had a conversation once. Um, probably the closest person that I could give you an example of of a person that I know would be my wife, right? And every husband, every every wife uh, can look at your spouse. You yada your spouse. You know your spouse. Nobody else in this world knows your spouse like you know your spouse. Right? There's a very deep, intimate knowledge. Why? Because you spend time. You have conversations. You, 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 know, you know the good and the bad. You know the strengths and the weaknesses. You know the conversations. When the doors are shut, the things happen there that nobody else has privileged to. That's the kind of relationship that, that, that David was telling Solomon. I need you to know the God of, of your father. And, and who's his father? And I find it very interesting that, that he says, Solomon, you need to know the God of your father. David is saying, you need to know my God. Solomon, you've seen me. I'm your dad. You've watched me. You grew up in the same house as I did. You see how I carry along my business. You see how often I go to the temple. You see what I do when I'm there. You see when I get up. You see when I have conversations. Do you, this, I need you to know, the, I need you to know, just like, you, like I know God, I need you to know God too. This is not just something that, that, oh, yeah, God, yeah, he's out there somewhere. People even refer, oh, the man upstairs. God isn't a man upstairs. We, got, we have to know him on a very deep, personal level. He's got to encompass everything. And when you look at the story of David's life and, and his interaction with, with God, it's something very intimate. And I love when looking through the book of Psalms, it's almost like I, I feel like I, sometimes, you know, you're, you're peeking into somebody's diary, or somebody's personal journal. You know, some of the things that David writes in Psalms, you're like, God, how did you let this in this, in this book? Right? He's talking about his anger. He's talking about his joy. He's talking about his, his fears. He's talking about, you know, he's repenting in there. All of the things that you probably have never heard from me and I haven't heard from you, all of those things we have privilege to when we open up the book of Psalms. 
And over and over we see this intimate connection of, of David pouring out his, 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 his open spirit before God, saying, God, this is how I'm feeling right now. And I want to turn to a passage. This is uh, Psalms chapter 18. And if you just look through, and I'm not going to be able to read the whole chapter, but um, I really like this one because David is just pouring, he's just gushing, I don't know how else to put it, um, of, of how much he adores this God that he serves. And I imagine that, that maybe, you know, uh, in addition to telling, hey, Solomon, I need you to know God, maybe David slipped in Psalms chapter 18 um, into, uh, into, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, into the, the portfolio of, of information, you know, from one king to the other. Look, at, look I'm just going to highlight, I don't know, maybe like 10 things or so in, in chapter 18. So Psalms chapter 18, um, starting in verse 1, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. I mean, I don't know how how you can start off more powerful than that, right? I love you, oh Lord, my strength. I, I would challenge you, and I'm challenging myself right now. How about we start off our prayers like that? Instead of like, you know, God, help me, right? God, I love you. Like, start off with something so simple. I mean, first doors, I mean, I, just a couple days ago, I was, I was going to work, and, you know, I usually try to get dressed in the dark because my wife is still sleeping. A lot of times we have one, two, sometimes three kids in the bed. Um, and so I try to keep the lights off. I have my clothes, um, you know, hanging up the day before, and there's been times where sometimes the belt doesn't match the shoes, you know, for various reasons. Um, but um, as I'm walking out, my youngest son wakes up, and he looks at me and goes, I love you, Papa. And, and he immediately closes my eyes and goes to bed. I don't know, there's, there's, I, he didn't need to say anything else. I mean, my day went from like here because I'm tired to up to here. David starts off with saying, I love you, O Lord. You are my strength. And he goes on in verse 2. He says, Lord, you are my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My, my God, you are my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Verse 3, I call upon you who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Verse 6. I called upon the Lord uh, to my God, and I cried for help from his temple. He heard my voice, and my cry from him reached his ears. If we look at, uh, scroll down to verse uh, 16, he sent from on high, he took me. He drew me out, he drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. He, they confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. And verse 29, um, uh, no, I'm gonna, uh, verse 31, for, uh, for who is God, who is the Lord, and who is a rock except for our God, the Lord who equipped me with my strength and made my way blameless. I mean, and I, you can just keep going because, I mean, he, he goes on and on about just every, like almost every other verse is just David just gushing about the um, amazing love that God has shown to him. And I imagine as he's standing before Solomon, he's saying, Solomon, love God the way I do. Get to know him deeply, intimately, like I know him. You can't, this can't be just a superficial thing of like, my dad loved him, so then, or knew him, so I must, you know, he gave me, he entrusted me with this kingdom. Solomon, you got to dig. Solomon, you gotta, you got to spend some time. Solomon, you got to get to know who this God is. Man, you got to read through some, maybe some of my old letters. Listen, remember some of the conversations I've had. Think about how I've acted. Think about what I've done. Right? And he's, he's trying to get him to, to kind of you know, understand that this is not just something that just is going to come out of thin air, but this is something that, he, that he's going to need to seek, and he's going he's to find it. And many of us, we try to hide our weaknesses. Right? We try to hide our struggles or our sins even before God. Definitely in front of each other, but, but especially before, in front of God. Psalms 139 verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. That word known is the same word that David told Solomon, you got to know your God. Psalms 139 verse 1. O Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. David is admitting, God, you know me very deeply. You know, very, you know me very intimately. Why? You've searched me. There's nothing hidden. He goes on and he, and he says that, right? And if you look at the very end of that same psalm, verse 23, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Verse 23. Um, Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. He said, God, man, after, I know you know me. And at the very end of it all, he says, God, I need you to keep knowing me. Know me even deeper. I mean, how, that kind of a relationship, that kind of a, he, David is begging God, begging God to look into his heart. 
on what's our, a lot of times our relationship is, oh, God, don't, don't go there. Like, leave, leave that part untouched, right? David is, and, and was David a perfect man? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And we know that, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. There's, there's things that David did that hopefully we don't do. Or hopefully, I'm sure David wasn't proud of. But when you look at David's reaction, David repents, David comes to God, and God hears his cry. And so, how do, how, you know, what does this mean for us today? Well, we can only truly know God in our hearts when we allow him in, in there. When we truly allow him. And, and how do we do that? Well, we have to know who this God is that you serve. Right? We can't, just like David said, you gotta, you don't just build off of me. You gotta know, intimately know the God that I serve. You gotta know him personally. And when you do that, Solomon, you're going to be all right. And so for us, you know, a lot of our human relationships are, if I love you enough, then I'm going to open up. With God, I think it works a little bit differently. you gotta, you got to love God as much as you can, and God, God it will immediately begin to do that work in your heart. God is waiting. God did his end of the deal. God is waiting for you to open that up, right? That desire to, to know him on a very deep level. And you, that, that's through spending time, through wanting that, that relationship, right? I think God also doesn't go into places that he's not wanted or welcomed. Um, he can, but I don't think he does. And that takes me to that second point. If we go back to First Chronicles just for, just for a second. Um, in in uh, the second thing that he says, he says, Solomon, my son, you got to know the God of your father. you got to serve him with your whole heart. you got to serve him with your whole heart. Um, and he goes on in that same verse. He says, because the Lord searches all hearts. God searches hearts. And so what kind of a heart should you have, Solomon? You've got to have a loyal heart. In other translations, um, it says that you have to have a perfect heart or you have to have a, a, um, um, a whole heart. Uh, so loyal, perfect, or whole. Essentially, those words are interchangeable uh, depending on which translation. It means that you don't have kind of split loyalties, right? You don't have, it's, it's like you can't, you can't have one side of your heart being loyal over here and one side of your heart being loyal over there. It's this, this perfect peace, this perfect trust in, into one place. A perfect trust into one place. Um, now, why, why is that so important? Why is it important to have a loyal heart? If we look in Jeremiah um, chapter 17, um, in v- verses 9 through 10, it talks about the fact that our heart is deceitfully wicked. That our heart is deceitfully wicked. And then in verse 10, it tells us that I, the Lord, I search the heart. This is Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10. I, the Lord, I search the heart. Right? God is in the business of searching people's hearts. And he, the, the hearts that he cannot fully use are hearts that are n- split. A heart that's really loyal over here and trying to be loyal over here. Remember, Jesus said the same thing. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot be loyal and loyal. The Bible says you're going to love one and hate the other. And so God understands that, right? And I think he created us to really choose one or the other. You cannot find yourself in the middle. And so one of my personal favorite passages, I'm going to go back to Psalms. You're going to hear a lot from Psalms today. Psalms chapter 27 because again, this is David's, I think this is, I mean, we're looking through David's personal diary here um, and how, he, how his, he interacted um, with God and what he said to God. And if you look at uh, Psalms chapter 27, uh, verse, I'll start in verse 7. Psalms 27, verse 7. It says, Hear, O Lord, Psalms 27, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. When, when, Jesus, when, when God says here in verse 8, you have said, seek my face. It's actually in the plural, and I've shared this before. It's in the plural. It means everybody, you all, right, to the southerners, y'all. Y'all seek my face. You all seek my face. Everybody, seek me. Look, but David's response in the second half of verse 8 is personal. David singles himself out. As if to say, God, I understand the call was out to everybody. I'm going to make this about me and you. And he, that, and then he says, my heart, I can't guarantee what other people are going to say. None of us can. I can't even guarantee what my spouse or my kids are ultimately going to say. I can only take responsibility for myself. He says, my heart says to you, your face, Lord, 
do I seek? Right? David makes it a personal call. God, we know God, the salvation was, was open to every single one of us. But it's up to every single one of us individually to make sure that that actually comes true and that becomes a reality uh, in our lives. And David also understands that he himself cannot cleanse his heart of unrighteousness. He understands that. If you remember, um, David writes a psalm after he was caught in sin with Bathsheba. Remember, the prophet Nathan comes and he, he rebukes him. He tells him, David, you're wrong. And it's Psalms ch uh, chapter 51 is, is David's a psalm of repentance. Um, and uh, if we look at verse 10, David acknowledges that I, he sins before God. Look at verse 10, Psalms 51, verse 10. It says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. David has to go to the source. He has to go to the source. He says, God, I need you to cleanse my heart out again because I can't do it on my own. The only thing I can do is acknowledge that I've, I've done a sin, acknowledge that I'm in the wrong, and then I gotta come back to you. I gotta come back to you, right? And you can see at every turn, David's heart keeps going back to God. Not that David was perfect. David was, was far from, from perfect. David had, had, had a lot of things that, uh, that, that, he, that he made mistakes on, just like any one of us. But why does God single out David's heart? Now, I'll show this in a second, um, is because David keeps coming back. Now, when we talk about, you know, cleaning a heart, so I'm going to stay, just pause here for a second. Creating me a clean heart. How do we actually clean? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a, there's, you know, I love getting mail. All right, so if anybody wants to send me letters, by all means. I like getting mail, even as junk mail. Um, I'm a big fan. I like to hold on to some mail sometimes. Um, you know, credit card offers, I don't really use them, but like, you know, just like, whatever. I, I, I stack it soon after a while, you know, there's, there's stacks there. We have like a half wall. Um, in our house by our kitchen like a lot of times the mail just piles up on that half wall and then all of a sudden one day Mail's gone what Happened to the mail. There's something really important in there, you know um, It's it, it could be a variety of different things. Sometimes it could be in the recycling um, in the recycling bin. Yes, we recycle uh, Sometimes it's in the garbage. Sometimes it's just in, in junk drawers. Sometimes it's it's filed away um, there's kind of two philosophies in our house. Um, one is a, maybe a hoarding mentality. Um, the other one is out of sight, out of mind. Um, sometimes, you know, we clean in different ways. Uh, you know, uh, and sometimes when we don't see it, that means it doesn't exist. And, you know, when, but is it, is it clean? I probably need to do a better job of keeping what's important, getting rid of the old, right? Um, but I think on the, on the other side, um, the other tendency in my house is sometimes to put things away, junk drawer or somewhere, um, and then it disappears and it looks clean, but if I open up the junk drawer, you know, stuff's coming out. Same with cleaning closets, you know, and um, not that we have a problem with that in our house, but sometimes you'll tell the kids, you know, to clean up and the room looks fine. Right, or the, the basement looks fine, but things are shoved behind the couch, you know, they're just, you know, they're under pillows. Um, you know, that, is that how we clean? Uh, or, you know, sometimes we have, you know, you know, we clean our garage, but then we just shove everything into storage, or um, we just move it from one side of the garage into another side of the garage, and we call that cleaning. Uh, that's not the kind of cleaning that, we, that God is talking about here. When we talk, when God talks, David begs God to clean, it's get rid of it. It's, out, it's not just out of sight, out of mind. It is, it is rid of, thrown out, never to be seen again. That's the kind of cleaning that David, that David is asking and I think one of the most terrifying passages, I think, that I find is if we could turn to Matthew um, chapter, uh, chapter 12, um, maybe you agree or not with me here, but uh, Matthew chapter 12, I, there's a lot of scary passages, uh, but one of the ones that I think I, uh, when I look at my own heart, uh, Matthew chapter 12, if we look at verse 43, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. Uh, when a, the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through a waterless place seeking rest, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house em empty, swept, and put in order. And when it, then it goes and it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it shall be with this evil generation." Notice that the cleaning aspect in and of itself is not enough. There was a story of a, of a, of a heart, right? Which the image here is a house. 
without get, get swept clean, everything gets put back in order. But what is the big problem? Was the cleaning part the problem? No. The fact is that that, that heart was never filled with anything. And the cleaning part is, is one step. Notice that David starts with saying, God, uh, David, uh, Solomon, you got to know your God. You got to know him intimately. Invite him in. He's got to be a part of your life. And then you got to make sure that your heart is in the right state. You got to make sure that it's loyal down to the core uh, uh, to, uh, uh, towards God. And then David, we see the heart of David here when we read. He says, it's got to be a clean heart. God, you make, make a clean heart. But it's not just enough to have a clean heart because a clean heart in and of itself will not guarantee that the right things will come out. we got to fill it. we got to fill it with the, with the correct things. And it's interesting that when you look at David's heart, um, if you remember, and I'm not going to read this passage just to save some time, if you remember when David goes to fight Goliath, right? He doesn't know that he's going to fight Goliath. But when he arrives at the battle... His older brother, Eliab, comes to him, and he, and he said, David, what are you doing here? He's like, I know the evil heart that you have, David. I think David, Eliab is still hurt by the fact that David was anointed king and not David, and, and that David was anointed king and not him, right? He says, I know the evil heart. You came here because you want to fight. It's interesting that Eliab, the reason why Eliab wasn't chosen, if we look at why does, why, why was Eliab not anointed? God said, you're looking at the physical part of, of a man, the physical stature, the strength, the age maybe, but I, the Lord, I look at the heart. Why, was, why were none of David's, I think it was eight brothers, why were none of them chosen? There was something that God didn't like about their heart, but this young kid didn't qualify by any other metrics except for the fact that he had the heart that God could trust. Everybody else was discounted. Physical stature didn't matter. Age didn't matter. He said, I trust David's heart. And it's interesting that that Eliab tries to call out David's heart. I know the evil in your heart, but no, no, no. It wasn't David's heart that was evil. It was probably Eliab's. David had a heart after God's own heart. And we we know that um, David gets called out for that. And so it starts with that correct kind of state of our heart, that we need to make sure that our heart is right, um, you know, and and willing to allow God to do his work in there. Um, We know that ultimately Solomon does not follow David's, David's suggestions. Um, and his, it actually says that his heart was not true. He follows after wealth. He follows after, uh, after status and prestige. Um, but David gives him the, the, the direction. Uh, it was up to Solomon to follow. And the last thing that I wanted to point out, uh, if we go back to uh, Chronicles chapter 28, First Chronicles chapter 28, we talked about Solomon. You got to know the God of your father. You got to serve him with a whole heart and with and with a willing mind. The last one is with a willing mind. Um, True service and true love uh, is not forced. It cannot be forced. True love cannot be forced. Um, It has to be voluntary. It has to be willing. And um, you know, if we look, if you remember that Jesus, when he was talking to the woman at the well, um, he says that. Um, the true worshiper, true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. Now, this idea of worshiping in truth, right? It's not that it's fake. It's not fiction. It's not made up, right? It's something that's honest and real. And so when we talk about some, something that's, that's real, that's true, right? Something that when I love, I love for real, right? Um, We have to be able to serve God with a willing heart, not that it's through force or through some kind of a demand. Um, And it's it's important to have the correct mindset. A person thinks on average, I heard, um, on average 50,000 thoughts a day. 50,000 thoughts a day. Those of you that, I don't know, work construction probably do probably even more um, because you guys have to do all those measurements and stuff. Studies show that approximately 70% of our thoughts are negative. 70% of our thoughts are negative. That's about 35,000 thoughts out of the 50,000 that we think are are negative. Uh, It could be about ourselves. It could be about our situation, about our family, whatever it might be, are are considered negative. Now imagine if thoughts are what direct you, right? If thoughts are what direct you, um, and, and more than half of them are negative, it's no wonder then that so much, so much of what we see in our life is in the negative. We're constantly struggling. We're, we're I don't know, we, we get into problems or situations because our mind directed us into that direction. 
And so David, notice that he tells Solomon, Solomon, you got to have a willing mind. That's a positive. He's not telling him not to do certain things. He says, I, this is what I need you to do. Your mind has to be willing. You have to do this willingly because you want to, in truth, right? Um, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, um, Paul highlights this. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? How do you, tra- be, how do you become transformed? By the renewal of your mind. It starts up here. Because once it's up here, that's gonna, it's a, a pretty good compass into which way your life is going to go. Now, and I'm, I'm not going to preach that, that would now that's it. It's a good mindset and everything in your life, you can think it and it will be a reality. But in a, lot of, in, in a lot of ways in our life, what we allow ourselves to think about is the direction that our life is going to go. You start to think about the negative, about the problems, about you know, things that are wrong. That's the direction that, that it's going to take. And I still remember um, I was doing my student teaching, and I, it was, um, it was the, the, I don't know, the storm of whatever it was, 2008 or 2009. Uh, we had like 20 inches of snow, and um, you know, schools were out for a really long time. And then you know, c- coming back in, and it was, you know, it was kind of hard to get going, and it was kind of deep in the, into the trimester. Uh, students were struggling. I think I was running out of steam. I remember hearing um, a friend of mine just said, hey, listen, apparently um, if you smile, it, like, it like helps change your attitude. There's something about the connection between the, fa- the muscle faces, you know, sorry, the, the facial muscles that when you smile, there's something that changes in the, in the, in the mind about it, kind of uplift- uplifting your general attitude. So on a particular you know, tough morning where I was just not feeling, I don't know if my lesson wasn't very exciting or something, I was just wasn't excited for the day. I remember, you know, getting out of my car, and as I'm walking to school, I remember that thought came through my mind about my, a friend of mine saying, you know, you try to smile. Um, and, uh, you know, I know it's not a ru- natural thing for Russians. One of my former students um, actually said on, on his final exam, he said, Mr. Perm, smile more. Uh, so uh, I guess I haven't put it into practice quite yet. But uh, so I'm walking out of my car, and I, I just forced myself to smile. I must have looked kind of crazy, you know, just a random man walking down the street smiling to himself. Um, and I'm telling you that for some, for some reason, by the time I walked into that door, and I didn't realize this until later, um, by the time I walked into that door, the whole, my whole attitude had changed for the day. Nothing changed. I was still the same amount of sleep. My lesson was still the same, same kid, same person. But the attitude that you, that you, that you create, the willingness that this is something that I need to do or need to accomplish, changes a lot about how the rest of your day can go. And so for us... Um, we have to understand that we have to control our thoughts. We have to control our, the, the, the set of our mind. I'm going to read out of uh, 2 Corinthians. Um, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Uh, just a, a couple passages here. Um, starting in verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war against the flesh... For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. They destroy arguments and very lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God and and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Notice that a lot of times our problems come not necessarily from our interactions with each other, but there's a bigger battle that we fight, right? Um, He talks about um, that this is, these are, we don't, we walk in the flesh, but our, our war is not in the flesh. Right, um, so a lot of times it's the stuff that is it's the supernatural attacks, it's the mental attacks. It's it. We have to understand that. Okay, They're not that it's going to you know maybe change what, how we we live our life, but then in verse five he points out that we destroy arguments, every lofty opinion raised against God, and what do we do? We take every thought captive. Imagine if you can take every fifty thousand of your thoughts and control the direction that, that it goes. And instead of coming to a negative conclusion, you, you direct them into a positive conclusion, right? Through knowing God, through having that loyal heart, through having that willing mind. David is laying out for Solomon, Solomon, this should be the foundation of everything that you do. You got to f- figure out who God is. You got to know him deeply and intimately. You got to make sure that your heart is in the right state. That it's not split between this and this. And we know that Solomon didn't do that. Solomon split his loyalties. He tried to serve God and his wealth and his desires. And ultimately that wasn't good. And God called him out for it. Solomon, you did not serve me with the whole heart. 
And you got to make sure that your mind is in the right state. You got to make sure that you are controlling your thought, taking every thought captive. Because it is through our thoughts that we can have victory, right? We destroy arguments, every lofty opinion, by taking every thought captive, right? Um, and verse 7, and I like verse 7 here. This is 2, Chronic, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10, verse 7. Look at what is before your eyes. If anyone is confident that he is Christ, let him remind himself that just as he is Christ, so are we. What are we supposed to do? We're supposed to remind ourselves, I am a son or a daughter of Christ. There's something bigger at stake here. And as I conclude, David is speaking to his son. He had, he had, he had a lot of things that he possibly could have said. And instead he says, I'm going to give you these three goals. These three things, Solomon, that I need you to work on. Right? It's three instructions. You want to find favor from God in your life? You need to know God. You need to make sure you have a loyal heart. You have to have a willing mind. Now, why does David spend so much time kind of laying this out, making sure that, that Solomon understands these three things? Because so Solomon had a task to do. Solomon had a task to do, right? If we go back to, to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, he says, uh, this is verse 10, Be careful now. For the Lord has chosen you, yes, to be king, but even, I would say, in David's eyes, maybe even more than that. This is 1 Chronicles 28, verse, uh, verse 10. Be careful now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. He's saying, Solomon, you have a task at hand. It's a big job. This is a temple that you are going to invite people to worship me you got to make sure that your heart is in the right place. As you have a huge task at hand, you got to make sure it's in the right place. And my question to, to all of us is, what is our task? What is our task? Are we doing it? Are we fulfilling it? Every single one of us has a task that we need to fulfill before God. Are we doing it? Are we able to do what God has called us to do? And so if we're not, maybe we need to check, do we really know God on that intimate level? Maybe we need to check our heart. Is it truly loyal to God, or are we trying to split our loyalties between a couple of different things? And we check our mind. Are we willingly following after God, or is this something through force, a very immature type of relationship that God just cannot use because our mind is running after a lot of different things? And so on that note, I would like to ask us to pray that God would give us the strength to get to know Him deeper, make sure our heart's in the right place, and that we continue to follow Him with a willing mind. Let's pray.